Identity theft is the fastest growing crime in America. Welcome to my third lesson on Microsoft Access, where we'll expand on the tools used in the last two lessons, as well as learn how Access works with data brought in from external sources. Since we are going to build on the database skills taught in my first two lessons, you should have a grasp on the skills taught in those lessons, and be very comfortable using Windows XP. Let's take a quick look at what we'll tackle in this lesson. Our friend Eddie has been so successful at Rewind Videos that he bought out his closest competitor, Movie Time Videos. They're located in relatively the same neighborhood as Rewind Videos and share some customers. They built a good business, but the folks at Movie Time weren't very good record keepers. Movie Time used Excel as a database when they should have been using Access. Eddie, on the other hand, uses Access. So he wants us to update the movie time records to match the structure created for Rewind Video. So first, we'll create a new database. We'll then import the Movie Times Excel spreadsheet files to track their customers' inventory and rental records. To do that, we'll learn how to retrieve and convert data from an external source. Once the data is brought into the new database, we'll use the Find Duplicates query to help us eliminate redundant records. We'll define the relationships between imported tables and those that exist in Eddie's database for Rewind. We'll use a union query to combine the Rewind customer records with those from the new Movie Time customer table. We'll also learn additional methods of defining criteria to help enhance our search capabilities. Before we proceed, I'd like to introduce my student helper Suzanne. Just follow along with her and you'll be building powerful queries in no time. We'll start this lesson by converting Movie Time's existing Excel tables so they can be used in an Access database. We've placed the necessary Excel files on this CD. It isn't necessary to have the Excel program installed on your system. If you don't have Access already open, launch the program now. We have a lot to do, so let's get started. Eddie wants to convert all of Movie Time's data to Access, but isn't sure whether to put all of his records in the existing Rewind database or to create a new database for Movie Time. Let's see if we can help him decide. Both options have their advantages. However, since Eddie is treating each store as a separate business, it makes sense to keep Movie Time in a separate database. Still, he wants the public and his employees to think of them as one. He's going to allow customers of both stores to rent tapes from either store's inventory. Therefore, he wants to give the employees of both stores the ability to search the customer, rental, and inventory tables of both stores. When a customer seeks a tape not in Movie Time's inventory, an employee can search for that tape in Rewind's inventory. Access has the ability to link tables from one database to another, allowing Eddie to keep each store's records in separate databases and still have the freedom to compare and manipulate the information they contain. Creating a new database for Eddie's Movie Time store sounds like the way to go. Start with a new blank database. Make sure the task pane is available on screen by pressing Ctrl F1. Click the drop-down arrow and select New File. Select Blank Database. As mentioned in previous lessons, we need to name the database before we can create any objects. Click the desktop icon on the left side of the screen. Make sure the generic file name in the file name entry box is highlighted and type Movie Time Videos as the database name. Click the Create button. 
Now that we have created a database to store MovieTimes data, we can import the Excel spreadsheets MovieTime used to track its inventory, customers, and rentals. There are two ways we can work with data from external sources, such as an Excel spreadsheet or DBase data table. We can link the data to Access or import the data into Access. When creating a link to a data table in another Access database or to a data table residing in another application, such as Excel, the data remains in its current file format. When linking data, any updates made in the original data file appear in both instances. Linking files does have its shortcomings, however. Many of the fields in a linked table can't be modified in Design View, so property changes can't be made. Another shortcoming, and perhaps the most glaring, is Access won't allow us to assign a primary key to a field within a table linked to an application other than Access. Without a primary key, we can enforce referential integrity. Referential integrity is a system of rules Microsoft uses to oversee the relationships between records in related tables. It also serves to ensure we don't accidentally delete or change related data. The alternative to linking files is to import them. When Access imports data from a text file, another Access database, or another application, it copies that data, converts it, and creates a new database object within the Open Access database. One of the principal reasons for importing data is so we can customize it to meet our needs. If there is a downside to importing data, it is that we may lose some of the formats of the original Excel spreadsheets. Access usually works faster with its own tables and will be able to modify an imported table in ways we could not with a linked table. Armed with this information, it sounds like importing is the way to go. The actual process for importing and for linking files is almost identical. Begin by opening the File menu. Select Get External Data and click Import. The dialog box opens, asking us where to find the files we want to import. Open the Files of Type menu. Access can import data from a variety of formats – Excel, Paradox, Lotus 123, and others. We're importing Excel files, so make sure Microsoft Excel is selected. Click the drop-down arrow next to the Look In box and select the CD drive of your computer. It will display the Video Professor icon. Double-click the Practice Lesson Files folder and then double-click on Access 2003. Select the Excel file titled Movie Time Customers. Click the Import button. This file contains the names, addresses, and phone numbers of all the Movie Time customers. The Import Wizard strips the file of any formatting and leaves only a simple set of rows and columns of data. Access did most of the work of conversion for us, so we'll do the rest. The Import Spreadsheet Wizard lets us know if the file we are importing contains more than one worksheet or range. We have the option of isolating a worksheet within the imported Excel workbook or to isolate a particular range of cells within a worksheet. There's only one spreadsheet file, so make sure the Show Worksheets radio button is toggled on and the customer's workbook title is highlighted in the window. Click Next. Access recognizes the first row as the column headers and not data. That's what we want, so click Next. We'll be storing the data in a new table, so click Next. Access can index the columns of data we are importing, and if we want the index to allow duplicate records or not. We want all the columns to be imported, and for now, we will allow the data to be indexed with duplicates. Make sure the indexed fields says yes, duplicates OK. And the box do not import field is not checked. We will change the properties for each later, so click Next. Access wants to know if we want a primary key assigned to this table. Our choices are to let Access assign a primary key, choose our own primary key, or to not have a primary key at all. Although we don't have to assign a primary key to a table, not doing so will severely limit our ability to make use of the information the data table contains. On the left, Access has inserted a new column of numbers and labeled it ID1. 
This is exactly like setting an auto number field in a table using Design View, which is what we did in earlier lessons. Unless we make another choice, that column will become part of our data. We don't want to add that ID field to this table. We want to choose our own primary key. Click that option. Select Home Phone from the drop down list. Notice the column of ID numbers access inserted for us no longer appears as one of the fields to be created during the import process. Click Next and we'll move to the last screen. All we need to do here is name the table. Keeping with our earlier convention, we'll name it TBL MT Customers, just as it appears on screen. Click Finish. Access displays an error message stating it is unable to designate the customer's phone number as the primary key because there are duplicate phone numbers in the database. The movie timetable has duplicate phone numbers because that store identified customers by ID numbers, not phone numbers. This means a household with one phone number could possibly have more than one customer residing there. Rewind, on the other hand, currently allows only one membership per household. For our new database, we need to stick with that convention. We'll assign a primary key to this table after we've imported MovieTime's other tables. Click OK to proceed. Notice the error did not prevent access from successfully importing the data. It just couldn't assign the primary key we requested. Click OK to clear the confirmation message and return to the database window. The next spreadsheet we want to import is the inventory list. Click File, Get External Data, Import, and double click the inventory file. When the Import Spreadsheet Wizard appears, click Next three times to move through each screen until we are at the indexing screen. We definitely want to index by these fields, so make sure Yes, Duplicates OK is selected from the index list. Click Next to continue. This time, we'll let Access assign the primary key and ID number to each of the titles in our list. That is already toggled on, so click Next. Name the table TBL-MT Inventory. Click Finish. This time, there were no conflicts, and Access confirms the completion of the import. Click OK on the confirmation window to continue. We've got one more table to import. Pull down the File menu, select Get External Data, and Import. This time, double click the Excel file titled Movie Time Rental. When the Import Spreadsheet Wizard appears, click Next to move through each screen until we are at the Assigned Primary Key screen. We want access to assign a primary key to our records, so make sure that option is active. Continue to the next screen and name the table TBL-MTRental using the same method as before. Click the Finish button. Clear the confirmation screen. The three tables are now ready to be used in the Access environment. More often than not, our next step would be to define the relationships between the three tables. But first, we need to deal with the problem we encountered while importing the customer table. We had duplicate records within the home phone field. We need to correct that before we can assign a primary key to the customer table. To help us find the duplicate records, we'll use the Find Duplicates Query Wizard. Before we use the Query Wizard to find the duplicate records, let's take a quick look at the Movie Time Customer table. Double click that listing and maximize the window. 
The first column is labeled ID. As it turns out, Movie Time Videos didn't use the customer's phone number to identify them. Instead, Movie Time assigned a member number to each customer when they joined. Eddie plans to convert the Movie Time system to match the one he's been using at Rewind. So we'll designate the customer's home phone number as the primary key. This means we no longer need to use these ID numbers. Right-click the heading ID to open the drop-down menu. Select Delete column. Click Yes because we do want to permanently delete the ID field. We get one more warning box regarding indexing this field. We don't need any of the indexing properties for this field in our table. Click Yes. At the bottom of the screen, we can see that this table contains 327 records. It would take quite a while to manually find all the duplicates within this table, and with a larger list, it would be almost impossible. Access's ability to handle these types of problems is what makes it such a powerful program. Let's see how it can help us here. Close this table. Click the Queries Object button. Click the New icon. Select Find Duplicates Query Wizard. This wizard helps us find duplicates within a table, but not between tables. Click OK. The first window asks us to select the table or query we want the wizard to search. We want the customer table, which is selected. Click Next. This moves us to the next screen, where we indicate which field within the customer table contains duplicate records. Double-click the home phone listing. Click Next. We want to view all the available fields, so click the double arrow to move them to the right-hand box. Click Next. Name the query QRY-MTCustomerDuplicates. Once again, leave no spaces in between the title. We want to see the results from our query, so leave the View the Results radio button on and click Finish. The set of records resulting from a query is referred to as a dynaset. This dynaset reveals only a few duplicates, so let's look at them and see what we need to do. The first two records in this dynaset have identical phone numbers in their home phone fields, which is what we're looking for. The last names are the same but the first names are slightly different, and the addresses aren't even close. A call to the customer reveals she moved recently, but kept the same phone number. She moved from Washington Street to Elliott, so we can delete the record containing her old address. Click in the gray column to the left of the phone number to highlight the second line. Press Delete. Before clicking Yes to confirm the deletion, remember data records in a query table are linked to the table it's based on, so making changes here also changes the table. We want the change, so click Yes to confirm the deletion. The next two records have identical field information except for that in the first name field. A phone call to Mary Martin confirms she and Dennis are married and they don't mind sharing the same membership. So add Dennis's name to Mary's record and delete the duplicate just like Suzanne is doing. The same is true for Jennifer and Eli Palmer, so change one record and delete the other. Close the query window. Since we have the Find Duplicates query already built, let's run it again to confirm Access deleted the files from the customer table. Double-click the query object we just made, and we have an empty dynaset. Close the query to return to the database window. Since we no longer need the customer duplicates query, be sure the query is highlighted and press the Delete key. 
The warning box gives us one last chance to stop the deletion. This allows us to stop and think before we delete something we may actually need. Because the wizards are so easy to use, recreating this query makes more sense than saving it. So finish the deletion by clicking Yes. A little bit later, we'll be linking some of the tables from our Rewind Videos database to this one so we can compare records. There's one more thing we should do to make sure we can work with data from movie time. Let's look at each table to make sure the field labels match the ones from Rewind. It will make our job a lot easier if the field labels and formatting are the same in all the tables. From the database window, switch to the tables group and open the customer table in design view. First, we need to format the start date field so its contents appear in the short date format. Select a start date row. Click the Format Field box in the Field Properties area. Press the S key to enter the Short Date option. Change the Home Phone field to read Customer ID, just the way it's written on screen. Just double-click it and type over the words. Click the shaded column on the far left to highlight that line. Click and drag the mouse to reposition the new customer ID field to be the first one in this data table. The other fields will adjust accordingly. Remember, we don't have a primary key for this table, so let's take care of that. Set the customer ID field as the primary key by clicking the key icon. We'll need to create input masks for our customer ID and start date fields, so with the customer ID field still selected, Click in the Input Mask box. Click the Input Mask Build button to open the wizard just as we did in the Level 2 lesson. It is the button to the right of the white information section that looks like an ellipsis. Click Yes to save the table. The first choice is for a phone number, which is what we want, so click Next. This format is fine. Click Next to continue. Click the With the Symbols in the Mask radio button. Click Finish to return to Design View. Eddie's customers live in the same area code, but due to the local phone company's 10-digit dialing requirement, his employees must include the area code each time they enter the customer's ID. Eddie's employees are tired of entering the parentheses and the area code. Let's make sure their busy lives are a little less stressful. We will edit the input mask to include the area code as a default value so Eddie and his clerks don't have to type it in anymore. We'll do that using quotation marks to segregate the specific strings of text from the placeholders, much like we did in Level 2. We're using the field properties window rather than the wizard to make these changes because in the wizard, we'd have to retype the entire string. Here, we only need to insert our changes. Replace the 999 with 303. Remember to put quote marks around the zero so Access can distinguish it from an O. Click outside the field to view the changes. The quotes shifted to around the full area code, including the space. This string of characters inside the quotes will be automatically populated when a phone number is being entered. Notice we've activated the auto-correct button again. We don't need to further update anything right now, viewers. If you ignore it, it will eventually go away. Most data entry will be done through forms, and the formatting we set in a table will pass to the forms connected to it. Let's add a record to the customer table to see how our input mask works. Switch to the datasheet view. Save the table when prompted. Move the mouse to the navigation area and click the New Record button. Once the empty New Record field appears, make sure the Customer ID field is active. The input mask we created is already at work and will appear once we type the first character. Viewers, enter your telephone number. The area code we entered appears in the Customer ID field encased in parentheses and the input mask inserted a space after the right parenthesis. Viewers, enter your name and address and use the current date for your start date.
It seems to be working well. Close the customer table and open the inventory table in design view. Let's make things a little easier on Eddie by formatting this inventory table to match the table in the Rewind database. Remember from lesson one that although we can create field names with spaces in them, it's better not to. It's a good idea to keep the same convention in naming. Change the generic ID to tape ID so this field matches the one in Rewind's inventory table. Delete the spaces in the year released, purchase date, and close cap field names. Change the data type for close cap from text to yes no so it appears as checkboxes instead of text. Format the purchase date as a short date. Close and save this table. And open the rental table in Design View. Change ID in the top row to Rental ID. Change the text customer phone number to Customer ID, just the way Suzanne has. Change the input mask for Customer ID so the default is 303. Set the formatting for rental date to short date. Repeat those steps for date due and date returned. Close and save the table. We won't need it again for a while. Now we're ready to define our table relationships and begin working with our data. Click the Relationships icon to open that window. It's on the toolbar and looks like three tables connected. Double-click each of the three movie time tables and add them to our workspace. Close the Show Table window. Resize and rearrange the table windows so they look approximately like Suzanne's with the customer table on the left and the rental table in the middle. We want the customer and rental tables linked together using customer ID as the common field. Click the customer table's customer ID field and drag it onto the rental table's customer ID. Release the mouse button, and the Edit Relationships table opens. At the bottom of the dialog box, Access informs us it identifies this relationship as one to many, which is what we want, and we don't want to enforce referential integrity, so leave that box unchecked. Click Create. Now join the inventory and rental tables using Tape ID, again without enforcing referential integrity. Click Create. Remember, it isn't possible to enforce referential integrity between these tables because there are multiple copies of some tapes in the inventory table and duplicate entries of the tape ID in the rental table. The reason we need to define relationships between tables is so Access has a basis for comparing data when running queries. For example, let's say we want to build a query telling us what our most popular movies are. We could get that information from the rental table, but it doesn't contain the titles of the movies, only their ID numbers. We need to use the inventory table to give us that information. If the two tables weren't related using the tape ID field, Access would have no way to give us the information we need. If we ran a query between two tables where no relationship has been defined, Access would return an error message, letting us know we need to define a relationship. Close the Relationship window and save the changes.
It's time we use queries to do more than simply select records. We're going to use them to manipulate data. The customer name, tape title, and overdue queries we've built so far are referred to as select queries because they display information but don't modify it. Now we're going to take a look at a group known as action queries. Unlike select queries, action queries let you change data in existing access tables. There are four types of action queries, append, delete, make table, and update. An append query adds a group of records from one table to another. For example, we would use an append query to scan a table called orders. We could copy all the records with a value in the date shipped field and append those records to a table called filled orders. Then we run a delete query to scan the orders table and delete those same records. So our orders table would show only the records we still need to ship. As its name implies, a make table query creates a new table based on the information in an existing table. This is useful if we want to select specific information from the table and examine it more closely. An update query allows us to change the data in a table. Let's say we need to increase the price of all green widgets by 10%. It's much easier than changing the information one widget at a time. With all these queries, we start out by first building a select query to gather our data, then change the query type to the one that best suits our needs. Eddie has asked us to check the movie time records for customers who have not rented a movie for over a year, and move them to an inactive customer's table so he can review them. We're going to build a select query to find the inactive customers, and then convert it to a make table query to give us a table. Open the Queries object window. Double-click the Create Query in Design View option. When the Show Table dialog box appears, place the Customer and Rental tables on the work surface either by double-clicking each listing or by using the Add button. Click the Close button. As we can see by the relationship line connecting the Customer ID fields, the customer and rental tables are already related. We established this earlier by using the customer ID number. Double-click the asterisk in the customer table to add all of that table's fields to our query. Double-click the rental date field from the rental table. Click in the criteria line of that field. Type a less than sign, an equal sign, and the date 12.31.02 using forward slashes between the numbers just like Suzanne is doing. We've just told Access to find any records in the rental table where the value in the rental date field is less than or equal to 12.31.02. In plain English, this means we want to see who hasn't rented a tape since the last day of 2002. Hit Enter, and Access fills in the pound signs, designating this as a text string and not a mathematical equation. Access knew to do this because the field contains the date format. We want to sort our list by customer ID. Since we can use either table's customer ID field to do that, let's add the customer ID from the rental table. Double-click that field listing. Click in the Sort field box of that new column. Use the drop-down list to select Ascending. Toggle off the Show command for this criteria column. If we were to run this query by clicking the Data View button now, we would see two customer ID fields appearing in the table created by this Select query. We don't want this confusion. Access has the ability to sort data by a field that doesn't show up in the query. Click the View button to see the results of our query. These are the customers who have not rented a tape since 2002, with their contact information and every instance of their rentals. Scroll down to see all the records. So far, all we've done is create a select query to show us who has not rented for at least the last year. 
Turning this into an action query is as easy as clicking a button. Click the View button again. Click the arrow that's on the Query Type icon. It has two overlapping tables on it. Use the pull down menu to select Make Table. In the Make Table window, name the new table. We'll call this one TBL MT Find Inactive Customers. Leave Current Database selected and click OK. Click the Run button. It has an exclamation mark on it. Choose Yes to confirm we want to paste the records to a new table. By saving this query, Eddie can use it each year to find inactive customers by simply changing the date in the Criteria field. Close and save this query. Name it QRY-MT Inactive Customers. Click OK. Notice this new query is distinguished by the exclamation mark and starburst on its icon. A table may be good only once, but a query often can be used over and over to retrieve different data. Switch to Tables and open the table we just created. Don't be confused by the fact that it looks like the query we just closed. That would be true for any table based on a query. This table still shows a record for each time these five customers rented a tape in 2002. We don't need to show that information, and even in a small table like this, it creates a lot of unnecessary clutter. Understand, it is very commonplace to use more than one query when extracting detailed information from a database. Our solution here is to run another make table query based on this table and use the count function to streamline our table. Close this table and from the database window, switch back to the query object group and double click create query in design view. Double click the table inactive customers. Close the show table window. We want to see all of the fields in this query. Unfortunately, Access won't let us insert those fields as one group using a function like count. In order to work around this, we'll need to place each field on the grid individually. We want all of the fields in view. Let's reduce the bottom half of the window to create enough space on top. To resize the window, float your cursor over the borders that run just below the horizontal scroll bar. When the cursor changes to a double arrow with a bar in the middle, use click and drag to make the changes. Hold the cursor over the bottom of the table window and use click and drag to expand that window so all the field names show. Expanding the table window enables us to see all the field names. We won't have to stop and use the scroll bar while adding fields to the grid. Double click each item in the list to move it to the grid below. Now each field in the table will appear in our query results. Scroll to the right of the grid as necessary to confirm you've placed all nine fields. Rental date will be the last one you see. Stay there. Next, we're going to tell Access to count the number of times each customer rented a video before December 31, 2002. Click the View menu on the toolbar. Select Totals from the list. Access added a new line to the grid just under the line identifying the tables. Using the Grouped By commands on this line, we can instruct Access to search a specified field for records that have identical values and combine them into a single record. Place the insertion point in the Group By cell under Rental Date. Click the pull-down list and choose Count. Click the Datasheet View icon. And there are the five inactive customers with one record each showing a count of the number of times each of them rented a tape prior to 2002. We don't really need our records to show us the number of rentals. Our goal was to create a table showing the name of each inactive customer once.
Return to Design View. Remove the check mark from the show box under Rental Date. Click the Query Type icon. Select Make Table Query. Name this table TBL MT Inactive Customers. And click OK. Click the Run icon. Choose Yes to confirm the creation of the new table. Return to Datasheet view to check the results. Close this query and save it. Name it QRY MT Inactive List with no spaces. Click OK. Click Tables. We no longer need the table MT Find Inactive Customers, so delete it from the Table Objects list by highlighting it and clicking the Delete icon. Answer Yes in the warning box. Our next step is to compare this inactive customer list with a rewind customer list to see if any of the records match. First, open the new Movie Time Inactive Customers table in Design View and set Customer ID as the primary key. Close the table and save it. We are ready to learn how to link tables that reside in separate databases. We can't very well compare Movie Time's customer list with that of Rewind's unless we have the Rewind customer list available to us in our Movie Time database. We could import a copy of that table, but that would mean updating both databases every time a change is made in either table. That could cause a lot of inaccurate data. Linking the tables together alleviates that problem. We can link a copy of the Rewind customer table to this database, and because it's linked, Every time the data is changed in the one table, both databases are updated. Eddie has added several new files to the Rewind video file. We are going to use that file instead of the database we created in Lessons 1 and 2. Click the Start menu and select My Computer. Right-click the CD drive which contains the Video Professor CD. Select Open. Double-click the Practice Lesson Files and locate the file Rewind Lesson 3. Right-click the file and select Copy. Close the folder window and minimize access. Right-click anywhere on the desktop and select Paste. This is the Rewind file we will use from this point forward. Click the Movie Time file icon on the status bar to bring it back on the screen. Click File, Get External Data, and choose Link Tables. Click Desktop in the column on the left. Double-click Rewind Lesson 3. From the Link Tables window, select the table Rewind Customer. Click OK. The Rewind Customer table appears with a Movie Time Tables. The little arrow next to the table signifies the table is linked. If this were an Excel table, the Excel icon would appear next to the title instead of the standard access icon. We need to define the relationship between this table and our inactive customer table. Click the Relationships icon. Click the Show Tables icon. It's the one that looks like a small table with a yellow plus sign on it. We need both tables on the same workspace. Double-click the inactive customer's table to place it on the workspace. Now, the Rewind Customer table. Click Close. Click and drag Movie Time Inactive Customers table underneath the Movie Time's Active Customer table. Position Rewind's Customer table to the right of the Inactive Customer table. 
To make things a little easier to see, expand the table windows so that all the fields are visible. At times, the order in which tables appear on the relationship palette has an effect on what operations are functional between. Other times, it really doesn't matter what order they are in. We need to have our two tables in this order, or we won't end up with the correct join type when we define the relationship between them. You'll see what I mean in just a moment. Join the inactive customer table to the rewind customer table using the customer ID field. Note the relationship between these two tables is one to one. In a one to one relationship, each record in a table can have only one matching record in table B, and each record in table B can have only one matching record in table A. This type of relationship is not common because most information related in this way would be in one table. Click the Join Type button. Choose option number two. We want to include all records from the movie time and active customer table and only those records from the rewind customer list that match those in the movie time list. Click OK. Click Create. Note the arrow pointing from left to right indicating this is a left join. This is known as left join because we're including all the records on the table on the left and only matching records from the table on the right. A right join would work just the opposite. We could just as well have had our tables flipped from their current locations and chosen to create a right join. Close the relationships window and answer yes at the prompt. Our next step is to see if any of the inactive movie time customers appear in the rewind customer list. To do that, we'll run the query wizard to create a select query. Switch to the queries tab and double click the create query by using wizard option. When the dialog box opens, pull down the table slash queries list. Select the movie time inactive customers table. Click the double arrows to move all the fields from this table to the selected fields window. Select the rewind customer table. We want only the customer ID field in this table. Make sure it is selected and click the single arrow selection button. Click next to move through the screens. Leave detail selected. Name the query QRY-MT inactive customers in rewind. Make sure the Open the Query to View Information radio button is toggled on. Click Finish to view the results. When the query runs, our Dynaset reveals that four records, or customers from movie time, have accounts at Rewind, and only one, Angela Back, does not. We know that because we added the customer ID field from the Rewind table, and that field is blank for this record. A quick phone call tells Eddie this number is disconnected, so he figures she must have moved. In fact, these customers are all inactive at movie time and all but one has an account at Rewind. We'll go ahead and delete them all from the movie time database. Close this window. From the Queries window, double-click Create in Design View. Select the Movie Time Customer Table. Select the Movie Time's Inactive Customer Table. Close the Show Table window. Double-click the asterisk in the Customer Table. Then double-click the Inactive Customers Table Customer ID field listing. Pull down the Query Type list. Select the Delete Query option. Access adds the delete line to the grid. We've simply told Access to delete records from the customer table that also appear in the inactive customer table. Click the View icon to check the dataset that will be deleted. Make a note of one or two of the names so we can double check the results of our query. We want to make sure they all get deleted. Return to Design View. Click the Run button. Access states it will delete five records and we can't undo the action. 
For that reason, it is very important to always check and double check the data in the dataset before running a delete query, just as we did. We want these records deleted, so click Yes. That does it. The deletion is complete. Close this query. Save the changes. And name it QRY Delete Inactive MT Customers. Click OK. Let's check out the deletions. Click the Tables tab. And double click the MT Customer Table listing. Here's our customer table. Let's check it to ensure the delete query did its job. To do that, we'll instruct the find command to search the customer table for one of the customers on our printout. Click the find icon. It looks like a pair of binoculars. Let's see if Dana Khan has been removed from the list. Type her last name into the find what box. Click the find next button. When Access finishes searching, it tells us it has searched the records and couldn't find any records with Khan in their fields. Click OK to remove the confirmation box. We could try the other names, but they won't be here. Click the Cancel button. Close this table and close the database. Our next step in helping Eddie is to combine the customer data from both stores into one mailing list. We're going to combine the customer tables from both stores into one mailing list. To accomplish this, we're going to use a union query. However, we can't create this using a query wizard or the query builder pane that we've used before. Instead, we must construct the query from scratch using structured query language or SQL for short. SQL, often referred to as SQL, is a standardized programming language for asking questions about data in a database. All of the queries we've created so far have used SQL to convert the criteria statements designed in the wizards and the query builder pane into an SQL statement that Access can use to process our questions. In those queries, Access did the SQL conversion in the background. However, in creating a union query, we must create the SQL statements ourselves. Let's take a look at the SQL statement behind one of the queries we've already written, so we have an idea of what the language looks like. Open Rewind Videos and DVDs database. Select the Open icon, go to your desktop, and double-click Rewind Lesson 3. If you get any security or warning windows, just click Yes or Open to continue. Click the Queries button. Open the query titled Customer Name. Click the down arrow next to the View icon and select the SQL View option. Here's the SQL statement describing the actions we defined when we created this query in Lesson 2. It tells Access, in fairly simple language, to look in the Customer table and create a Dynaset that includes the Customer ID in one column and the customer's first name and last name into another column. In the process, it instructs Access to concatenate the name and put a header on that field called Full Name. Click the View icon to see the Dynaset contains the information specified by the SQL. Close this query to return to the database window. Before building the union query, we need to link the MovieTime customer table to Rewind's database. Let's do that now. Select Tables, pull down the File menu, and open the Get External Data submenu, and click the Link Tables command. Go to the desktop and double-click the MovieTime videos listing. 
When the dialog box appears, select the Movie Time Customer Table and click OK. Switch to the Queries window and double-click Create Query in Design View. Close the Show Table box as soon as it opens. Open the SQL view. The first code in all queries is the SQL select command. A union query has at least two of them, each requiring the same number of fields in the same order. We don't need this semicolon, so delete it and hit enter. Viewers, type the SQL statement you see here. Type it in exactly as it appears on Suzanne's screen, making sure to include commas, spaces, and brackets in the appropriate places. The blank lines are not a required feature when writing a SQL statement, but it makes it much easier to read. This SQL statement tells Access to select the named fields from the Movie Time customer list and Rewind customer lists. And with one keyword, Union, it tells Access to join these two lists into one. That's also what changes this from a select query to an action query. What is not apparent is that the word union also tells Access not to include any duplicate occurrences of matching records. Click the View icon to check the results. Save this query and name it QRY mailing list. Open the main database window. A union query is easy to recognize in a list by its unique icon. It has two rings joined together. Switch back to our new mailing list query in Design View. Records must match exactly from the query to recognize them as the same. If any aspect of any field is different from one table to the next, the union query will include both records. That means that if so much as one period or comma is different, Access will include two instances of the same record in the new Dynaset. Eddie will include this query just as it is, and as necessary, update the records in each of the tables separately. Since Access queries are dynamic, this query will refer to the current version of the tables each time it is run. When it comes time to print out our mailing labels, he'll run the union query again and design and print mailing labels using a report object based on the results. Close this query and return to the database window. Click Tables. Before we develop Eddie's database any further, he has asked us to glean some information. The first thing he wants to know is who his best customers are at each location. Open the Rewind Customer table and look at the column just to the left of the Customer ID number. The plus sign indicates the existence of sub-data sets. To see any record's sub-data set, simply click the plus sign next to that record. Whenever relationships have been established between tables, we create a sub-data set. A sub-data set is simply a small table hidden inside an individual record in one table containing the related data from another table. This is a complete listing of that customer's rental history, the tape ID of the movies they rented, and we can check to see how often they were late. This method is useful only when we want to look up the records for one customer, and even then, it would be more efficient to use a query. In this case, when all we want is a count of how many movies each customer has rented, using a select query is definitely the most efficient method. Close this table. Let's create a new query in Design View. Click Queries. Double-click Create Query in Design View. Place the Rewind Customer and Rental tables on the work surface by double-clicking them. Close the Show Table window. Also, resize the workspace area as Suzanne is doing at this time. Resize the tables so we can see their names on each respective title bar.
From the customer table, select customer ID, first name, and last name. Select rental date from the rental table. Remember, a query set up this way will return a Dynaset with a record for every time a customer has rented a tape. But that's not what we want this time. Click the View pull-down menu. Select Totals. That adds the group by line to our grid. Click the Group by line within the Rental Date column. Pull down the list and choose the Count command. Eddie is mostly interested in customers who have rented more than 20 times, so enter greater than or equal to 20, as it appears on your screen, in the criteria cell. View the Dynaset. And there's our information. We can define the list any way we like by changing the criteria to 25, 30, or any other number. But we have the information Eddie wants. Eddie also wants to know the zip code of the best renters. The two that are closest to his store are 80211 and 80212. So we'll modify this query to return only those names who live in one of those two zip codes. Return to Design View. Add zip from the customer table to our grid. Copy the criteria string that we entered within the rental date's first criteria field into the line below it. Move to the zip column and type 80211 in the first criteria field and 80212 in the second. This tells Access to create a dynaset containing customers who have rented more than 20 videos and live in either zip code. It's even possible to use different values in the rental date field. For instance, you could search for records from 80211 that have rented 30 times or more and records from 80212 that have rented 20 times or more. In the sort field of the zip code column, select Ascending. View the Dynaset and use your scroll bar to scan the results. Without a doubt, the majority of Eddie's best customers live in the 80211 zip code area. Close and save this query if you like, so you can have it for future reference. And with that, we've come to the end of this lesson. We've gone over a lot of material so it may be beneficial if you experiment creating some additional queries based on the data within our two databases. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. You can always go back to the original files and start over. Thank you for being such good students. And remember, there is always more you can learn from me, the Video Professor. <laughs>